Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you back to day two of Putting Patients First. I'm Sterling Bryan. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Michael Smith Health Research BC. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm a settler on these lands. I have English and Scottish ancestry. Um, in fact, my, the tie that I'm wearing today is the Baird Tartan, my family tartan on my, my mother's side. And I'd like to acknowledge that our main office uh, for the BC support unit uh, is in Vancouver and therefore is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As we begin our second day of the conference, I'd like to encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the many First Nations on whose lands we're gathered to learn and grow today. I'd also like to acknowledge that our funding partners, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and the BC Ministry of Health, um, uh, both are, are, are strong supporters of the support unit and also of this conference. Uh, and the support that they provide uh, makes this event possible. Um, and this event remains a cornerstone of, for our community to connect and celebrate the wonderful work being done to advance patient-oriented research in British Columbia. So just to start with a few housekeeping reminders. The program for today is embedded in the platform as well as available as a PDF in the resources tab on the left-hand side of the screen. If you have any challenges with conference technology, please select the tech support from the menu on the left side of the screen. There are folks available throughout the conference to help support if you find you've got any questions or challenges with the platform. For those of you who share content through social media uh, or simply follow along, we're using the hashtag PPF22. So please tweet, uh, um, tweet, tweet, uh, tweet uh, often and tweet, uh, uh, tweet frequently. Uh, and finally, while it's a one, it's, it is wonderful to have the ability to gather virtually for this conference, please do give yourselves a break from your screen at some point throughout the day. Stand, stretch, and hydrate as often as you need. Yesterday, we covered the first two parts of our theme for the, the conference theme, listening and learning. So we had yesterday a wonderful opening. Uh, we had um, uh, an opening prayer from Elder Roberta and Elder Barb. Elder Roberta has been with us at every single conference that we've hosted as part of the BC Support Unit. And it was lovely to have Elder Barb join us as well for that opening prayer. Bev Holmes, as the Chief Executive Officer for Michael Smith Health Research BC, provided a wonderful welcome. Uh, indicating the synergy that exists between the two organizations that have come together to form Health Research BC. We then went into what I would describe as an inspirational plenary session by Fred Cameron. Fred, if you're listening, I just want to say a huge thank you. For me, that was storytelling at its finest. And what a story you have to tell. And the story is about patient-oriented research as a life-changing intervention. And we wish you every success in the ventures that you're taking forward as a result of your engagement in health research. We then moved to have some fascinating breakout sessions. Obviously, I wasn't able to attend all of them because they ran in parallel. But I particularly enjoyed sessions that were beginning to explore issues around conflict of interest in patient-oriented research. We had a session that was uh, uh, describing community engagement in vaccine research, uh, the, in creating <clears throat> a vaccine research agenda for British Columbia. And we had discussions of patient engagement <clears throat> in the development of health policy. So I think those, uh, and, and there were many, many more, obviously, and, uh, and, and, and we saw through the, the engagement in social media, just how impactful some of those uh, breakout uh, sessions uh, have been for, for many people. 
And then we finished the day with an opportunity to remember the late Pat Atherton. I shed a tear yesterday in that session, as did many others. And uh, I'm going to try and resist shedding a tear again today, but that may well happen. Um, it was a wonderful uh, tribute to the contribution, the dedication uh, uh, that uh, the Pat has given to this event. And I think we should all thank Pat hugely. And Pat probably he is still looking down upon us and enjoying the, uh, the conference uh, from, from a different perspective today. And then we finished yesterday with the opportunity to announce the creation of a new award, the Pat Atherton Emerging Scholar Award. And we, uh, we had the inaugural uh, recipients of that, that award uh, for, both, for best poster and best oral presentation. Uh, those awards were presented yesterday and congratulations to those award winners. So it was a rich, varied, and, uh, and wonderful, uh, wonderful day that we had uh, yesterday. And now we moved to today. And today moves from listening and learning that we were doing yesterday to collaborating and changing. The content covers an array of topics that both demonstrate how far we have come in our collaborations, but also reminds us uh, 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 of how far uh, we have still to, to, to cover. Now, I'm excited for the opportunity to facilitate our keynote for the day focused on learning health systems. Learning health systems is uh, a topic that we've been discussing here in British Columbia now for quite some time. Um, it's, uh, it's a topic that uh, we were delighted was included as a requirement within phase two for the support unit, uh, the, the, for, for, for the support unit uh, in British Columbia or, or nationally, it, uh, it's included. And so, so we have developments in British Columbia that are moving in this direction. We've got examples of, uh, of, of, of learning health systems that are operating, uh, and we're going to have a discussion today uh, around, uh, around learning health systems, and that's the focus uh, of our plenary uh, this morning. So to start us off, we're going to hear from Dr. Tammy Clifford. Tammy uh, Clifford is, is now, uh, she's just moved into uh, a new role at CIHR that's been created, uh, which is called the Vice President Research Learning Health Systems. Um, and we'll hear more about uh, that role uh, uh, as, and, and the, the portfolio that, uh, that Tammy now uh, covers as she presents to us very shortly. Uh, I want to say uh, Tammy and I uh, know each other well. Uh, we've, uh, we were colleagues uh, uh, when she worked at the Canadian Agencies for Drugs and Technologies in Health. We had the pleasure of working together on the creation of a, of a stream uh, within CADF relating to uh, uh, non-drugs, uh, non-drug technologies. Um, so uh, uh, the, the uh, HTERP was the committee that was created, the uh, Health Technology Experts Review Panel. Um, I have to say that uh, CADF isn't renowned for its acronyms. Uh, I always struggled with HTERP as, uh, as a particularly uh, pleasant acronym especially when I previously worked at uh, worked for NICE, uh, which, uh, which seems a much uh, more uh, acceptable acronym. But anyway, um, uh, if, if maybe, maybe acronyms might not be Tammy's strength, but I'm sure the leadership of this portfolio within CIHR is something that Tammy is going to, uh, is going to uh, uh, well, she'll describe for us, and I'm sure that she will uh, be, uh, be leading very successfully. So we will, um, we will hear firsthand uh, from Tammy now um, about this new portfolio that's been created within CIHR, how it originated, um, and how it links to the CIHR strategic plan. And then following uh, uh, Tammy's uh, presentation, we'll be joined on the virtual stage 
by a number of leaders from BC who will draw upon their unique perspectives to reflect on what learning health systems mean to them and their work, as well as the opportunities and challenges for us to consider in BC's context. Given that we've got just a couple of minutes before uh, the clock uh, hits 8.45, uh, what I'll do, I'll just introduce, uh, I'll, I'll just um, uh, give, uh, give an introduction to those who will be joining us as panel members as well. Kim McGrail uh, will be on the panel, uh, as you know. Uh, Kim, I mean, many of you will know Kim well. Uh, Kim McGrail is a professor at uh, the School of Population and Public Health at UBC and also holds scientific director roles at both uh, Population Data BC and also uh, with the Health Data Research Network Canada, so the HDRN that's now been created under the uh, banner of SPORE by CIHR. So we have the opportunity to learn from Kim. And I have to say, Kim was probably one of the first people who really uh, uh, talked at length to me about learning health systems. So I'm delighted that Kim's able to join us on the panel as well. We also have um, Adira Levin on the panel. Uh, Adira, uh, again, will be known to, to many um, and wears many hats uh, also. Uh, she's the head of nephrology at UBC. Um, she's the executive director uh, at BC Renal, which is part of the Provincial Health Services Authority uh, within the province. And she is also uh, the lead for the post-COVID interdisciplinary clinical network, the ICCN that has been created. And boy, I've been involved in that and uh, the leadership that Adira has provided in order to make that a successful network has been just outstanding. So thank you for your work on that, Adira. We're also gonna be joined by Jacqueline Robinson. So Jacqueline um, brings lived experience uh, to the panel um, she is a COVID-19 survivor, um, but also brings the perspective of a, an experienced public health nurse. And she's worked very closely with Adira and her colleagues as part of the creation of the post-COVID interdisciplinary clinical network, and now as part of its operations. And then the final member of our panel is Margot Greenwood. And again, Margot will be known to many in British Columbia. Um, Margot serves as the academic leader of the National, sorry, the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health. She has a, uh, a, a, a faculty appointment. She's a professor at the University of Northern British Columbia and also is a, an advisor within the context of, of Northern Health. So those are our panel members, and I'm sure you'll agree that we are in for a rich discussion on learning health systems as part of our plenary session this morning. So um, what I would now like to do is uh, invite Tammy Clifford to join us on the main stage, and we will get started with our uh, presentation on learning health systems that will kick off our opening plenary. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sterling, for the kind welcome and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I have asked there, we have the slides coming up, so that is terrific. It's a, an absolute pleasure to be here with you today to talk about some things that are happening at CIHR. Uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, just remembering the use of acronyms there. And the things that I will be talking about relate to learning health systems and, of course, to putting patients first. I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from Ottawa, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. And the Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial and we're grateful for the opportunity to be present in this, their territory. Next slide, please. So at CIHR, 
we know that research has the power to change lives. As Canada's Health Research Investment Agency, we collaborate with partners and researchers to support decisions and discoveries and innovations that improve the health of our people and strengthen our healthcare systems. CIHR was created in 2000 under the authority of the CIHR Act. We are an independent agency composed of 13 institutes and approximately 550 staff. And as part of the Government of Canada's health portfolio, we are accountable to Parliament through the Federal Minister of Health. Next slide, please. So CIHR's mandate is to excel according to internationally accepted standards of scientific excellence in the creation of new knowledge and in its translation into improved health for Canadians, more effective health services and products, and strengthened healthcare systems. Today, CIHR has an annual budget somewhere around $1.2 billion, and that funding goes towards supporting CIHR's mandate through the four broad functions that are noted on the slide. And so with that bit of background about CIHR, let's turn our attention to learning health systems. And with that, I would ask for the next slide, please. So while there may not yet be a consensus about the phraseology used around learning health systems, there is broad agreement as to the essential elements of a learning health system. On this slide, you'll see a schematic that I've pulled from Glauser's 2021 Healthy Debate article, which embodies the essential elements of a learning health system. These elements are aligned with those proposed by Labus and others in 2018, where a rapid learning health system was defined as one that is, first and foremost, anchored on patient needs, perspectives, and aspirations. Secondly, driven by timely data and evidence. Thirdly, supported by appropriate decision supports and aligned governance delivery and financial uh, arrangements. And lastly, enabled with a culture of and competencies for rapid learning and improvement. Put another way, learning health systems put patients first. Next slide, please. Now, I don't know if it's because I've been paying more attention to the learning health systems literature since I knew I would be moving into this new role, or whether there's truly been an increase in attention given to learning health systems of late. But regardless, I can see an increasing amount of discussion about learning health systems in both the peer reviewed and in the lay media. Next slide, please. If you're not yet convinced as to why learning health systems are important, I've showcased here a couple of recent media pieces, uh, actually from back in the fall around the time of the federal election. And these pieces speak not only to the importance of research, but also of measuring what matters and of strengthening the connections between patients, research, and healthcare provision. Next slide, please. So I'm sure that we've all seen these figures in the context of describing the two valleys of death, if you will, that occur in translational research. The first valley re relates to the translation of, of laboratory discoveries to humans, while the second valley concerns the translation of that resulting evidence to policy and to practice. No matter how you describe it, the 17 years for research to reach practice is way too long. And perhaps even more damning is the second statistic, that only 14% of research reaches a patient. Work out of Quebec suggests that less than one in five healthcare practitioners and administrators report using evidence-based practices frequently. Now, I know some of you will say, well, Tammy, these references that you've cited here are a bit dated. They do go back a decade or two. 
But I think you'd also agree that even if there has been some improvement in these values, there's still significant uh, room for us to do even better. And I think we're on the right slide now. Um, just uh, this one, Sterling, if I could look for you to confirm that we're at the research waste uh, slide. I um, think we're okay now. Okay, sorry about that. Perfect, no, my, I think my system's lagging here. So with that being said, it brings me to the concept of research waste. And here I share with you a figure from a 2009 paper by Chalmers and Glasgow. It was published in The Lancet. And their work estimated that 85% of research is wasted, 85%. Usually because it asks the wrong questions, it's badly designed, it's not published, or it's poorly reported. This not only diminishes the value of the research, it represents a significant financial loss an estimated $100 billion a year. And that figure was back uh, from back in 2009. It goes without saying that the waste identified at each of these four stages also poses significant ethical concerns. As Chalmers and Glasgow noted, many of these causes of waste are simple problems that could easily be fixed. And I'd suggest it's a learning health systems approach where patients are involved up front and throughout the entire process can help address some of this research waste, particularly in terms of that very first stage where research agendas, research questions, and outcomes are set. The fact that you are here at putting patients first makes me think that you would agree. Next slide, please. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't speak a bit about DORA. DORA is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. Now, many research funders, including CIHR, are signatories to DORA, which recognizes the need to improve the ways in which the outputs of scholarly research are evaluated. For us at CIHR, we will, together with our colleagues, be undertaking sig a significant piece of work in the coming while to broaden what is meant by research excellence so that the measures of impact beyond publications get counted. Remember, CIHR's mission is to not only create new knowledge, but to also enable its translation into improved health and strengthened healthcare systems. Obviously, scientific publications are an important way of sharing new knowledge, but publications in and of themselves are outputs, not outcomes. So how can we increase the impact of the research that we fund? How can we address the issues contributing to research waste? And how do we improve health and healthcare systems? Again, this is all pointing back to supporting learning health systems and ensuring that we put patients first. Next slide, please. Which now brings me back to CIHR. What we've done, what we're doing, what we plan to do to support learning uh, health systems across the country. Now, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with some or all of these programs and initiatives. You'll see SPORE, which is Canada's strategy for patient-oriented research the Health System Impact Fellowship uh, program through CIHR's Institute for Health Services and Policy Research. In the bottom right corner, you will be familiar with the knowledge to action cycle that underpins so much of our knowledge translation work. This was in fact developed by Dr. Ian Graham, who was CIHR's Vice President of Knowledge Translation uh, back in the, well, back a decade and a half ago. The top right uh, schematic refers to open science, and CIHR has a fundamental interest in ensuring that the findings that result from the research that we fund are available to the widest possible audience at the earliest possible opportunity. It's why CIHR's open access policy, whereby the costs uh, of open access publishing are considered eligible expenses on CIHR grants, 
has applied to work that's been funded from 2008 onwards. And actually, since the early 2000s, CIHR has recognized preprints as an important vehicle for the dissemination of research results. At the core of all of this is gender-based analysis, or GBA+. CIHR shares a commitment by the entire government of Canada to using a gender-based analysis plus uh, approach to develop effective policies and programs. So GBA plus is an analytical tool to assess the impacts of policies, programs, services, and other decisions on diverse groups of people taking into account sex, gender, and other intersecting identity factors. All of these activities existed at CIHR before I arrived at the agency, before the creation of this new learning health systems portfolio, and before CIHR's current strategic plan was launched. That being said, these activities often occurred in silos without the necessary concerted efforts at cohesion and coordination. As a result, we weren't necessarily learning from each other. We weren't making the most of existing assets, if you will. And quite frankly, we were missing opportunities to have an impact. Next slide, please. So that will take us fast forward to CIHR's new strategic plan, which may not be that new anymore. It was launched about a year ago um, last month. This new plan provides priority setting direction for us for the next decade. It's a 10 year plan. It also allows us to reprioritize and redirect resources on short notice to respond to emerging issues, example being the pandemic. Next slide, please. So the strategic plan outlines five priorities as well as a commitment to organizational excellence. Prior to the plan's launch last year, we spent two years engaging with individuals and groups who are part of the health research ecosystem. And I know many of you were involved in helping us develop this plan and we are ever so grateful for your support. Now, I'm not gonna go through each priority in detail, but suffice to say, I do hope you see yourself in these priorities. And if you don't yet see the connection, we'll flip to the next slide, please. We can take a deeper dive uh, into priority five, which is all about integrating evidence in health decisions. Now, some of you may be wondering why I, uh, now CIHR's Vice President Research for Learning Health Systems, I'm here today talking all about learning health systems. But if you look at our strategic plan, the phrase learning health system doesn't appear. This is not because we didn't consider that. But in the end, we went with this language of integrating evidence in health decisions to ensure that the plan speaks to everybody uh, in the country. Not everyone is yet part of a learning health system. Some parts of the country are and have embraced this. Other parts of the country are on the journey towards learning health systems, and others may still be a ways away from being able to make them a reality. So the language of supporting learning health systems at least in the strategic plan, would likely have led some to feel excluded. So that's why you see uh, this language rather than that learning health systems language per se. I would ask you to note that when we're referring to health decisions, we mean decisions of all kinds. That means decisions taken at the patient level, as well as those that support policy and practice. Next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. So I know I've talked a lot about CIHR and I've talked about learning health systems. CIHR, we recognize, is not a learning health system and that we are not in the business of healthcare delivery. That being said, we believe we can enable learning health systems through funding research, building capacity, focusing on knowledge translation, and providing advice to the minister. 
Put another way, by delivering on our mandate, CIHR can enable learning health systems by supporting the integration of evidence in health decisions. The final point on this slide, that evidence generated enables better outcomes at lower costs, while improving the healthcare experience amongst diverse patients, families, and health practitioners is at the very core of the Learning Health Systems portfolio at CIHR. Next slide, please. So this now leads me to describe the new portfolio. And again, while the portfolio is new, not all of the elements within it are new. All of the teams within the portfolio exist to support the integration of evidence into decisions. And while each team will have its own remit, the teams will work together horizontally, leveraging each other's respective strengths. I'll give you an example. The clinical trials team, which is a new team, will take on the good work previously done by our knowledge mobilization team in terms of the World Health Organization's clinical trials declaration. CIHR signed on to this declaration, which means that all trials funded by CIHR are required to share their data publicly within 12 months of study completion. Similarly, my expectation is that the clinical trials team will lean on and learn from the SCORE team to ensure a patient-oriented research lens is brought to clinical trial design, including the identification of research questions and the, the selection of relevant outcome measures. And it would be magnificent for the work done through SCORE's innovative clinical trials initiative to be used by those who design the trials that will be eligible for funding through the new clinical trials fund. Now, more on the specifics of the new portfolio shortly, but I cannot underscore enough, this new portfolio will work closely with partners throughout the health uh, ecosystem. And this means you. Next slide, please. So in terms of those specifics that I had referred to, here is the new team that I have the privilege of leading. We have three new executive director roles, one for patient-oriented research, one for clinical trials, and one for the Center for Research on, in Pandemic Preparedness and Health Emergencies. There is also an associate vice president who oversees our evidence integration team. Collectively, they will be responsible for knowledge mobilization, training and capacity development, research excellence, ethics, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we are also building a foresight and impact function into this group. Clinical trials, the Center for Research on Pandemic Preparedness, and the foresight and impact function are new additions to CIHR, complementing the work of the teams that have been in place for many years now. And I'm very happy to share that Dr. Megan Bettle is our new Executive Director for Clinical Trials. Megan spent many years at Health Canada working on the regulatory side of things. So she has an unparalleled understanding of the, the clinical trials landscape and the importance of having a robust clinical trials environment in Canada. Megan will be overseeing the Clinical Trials Fund, which is part of the Government of Canada's Biomanufacturing and Life Sciences Initiative. This will provide $250 million over the next three years to help build a foundation for a coordinated, cohesive clinical trials infrastructure for the country, to support the development of highly qualified personnel, to fund trials that address priorities uh, from the Biomanufacturing Initiative, and finally, to create a pan-Canadian clinical trial strategy. I'm equally thrilled to share that next month, Dr. Amy Lang will take up the post of Executive Director Patient-Oriented Research. Amy will be joining CIHR from Ontario Health, where she led a number of files and initiatives related to patient engagement. And prior to Ontario Health, Amy established and led patient engagement activities at Health Quality Ontario. Amy will work with stakeholders to support the development of new 
patient-oriented research and patient engagement initiatives at CIHR, as well as overseeing SPORE. And we will soon be announcing the new executive director for the C uh, Center for Research on Pandemic Preparedness. I did wanna take this time to note and to thank the patient partners who participated in these recruitments. Our entire recruitment process was approached in the spirit of partnership and reinforced for those who have been selected into the roles that this must become the standard for how we will approach our work. Now, in case you weren't jotting down notes as I spoke, we will be issuing an external communique about all of these changes in the next little while. And rest assured, there will be plenty of opportunities for you to meet and work with members of the team going forward. Next slide, please. Now, before I close, I thought I'd take an example from my own life and show how by putting patients first and by integrating evidence in decisions, a real difference can be made. I know I don't need to convince you of this, but want you to know that this work is more than just a job to me. So this is my dad. Uh, my dad passed away almost three years ago now having lived with Parkinson's disease for many years. If you count from the date of his official diagnosis, he lived with Parkinson's for a little over six years, but I dare say dad knew something was going on well before that. While they were working, my parents lived in a suburb of the greater Toronto area, the GTA. But after they retired, they moved, moved to a small town on the shores of Georgian Bay. With a population of 20,000, actually a little less, this was a place where the pace of life was slower, where the cost of living was more reasonable, and where they could be closer to some of my dad's siblings. At the time they moved there, dad wasn't showing any signs of Parkinson's. But as they started noticing things, as my parents started noticing things, they visited their family doctor who provided wonderful care. But dad also needed a specialist. And guess what? There weren't any neurologists in the area. Early on, my parents would have to go to Toronto, a two hour drive each way, assuming good traffic and good weather. Upon receiving the official diagnosis, my dad could no longer drive, which meant that my mom needed to do the drive to navigate to be dad's advocate. Their experiences going to Toronto weren't good and affected, adversely affected their quality of life. They were out of their comfort zone. By the time they got to Toronto for an appointment, they were tired and stressed. They had to find parking. They had to navigate large hospital complexes and were often kept waiting. Sometimes appointments were canceled while they were already en route. I tried to help as much as I could, but I live uh, in Ottawa, uh, a few hours away from them and have three uh, young children. So I offered my help remotely. I encouraged, uh, I, I encouraged them to consider participating in research, knowing that this could provide dad with early access to promising treatments. And even if those treatments didn't pan out, we know the care provided within the context of a clinical trial is usually excellent. Now, my parents are regular people. Um, my dad, uh, as smart and as inspiring as he was, didn't finish high school. They trusted those who were in positions of authority, and they took my advice to join a research study that was offered. Now, I have to say up front that there was nothing wrong, per se, with the study or its conduct, but rather the entire experience was suboptimal. And I suspect that my parents' experience being involved with research is not unique. Now, in the end, dad didn't complete the study. They were tired, stressed, worried. Uh, the trips to Toronto were a burden. And as dad's condition progressed, he needed to be in familiar surroundings. The rub here is that there are very few treatment options for those living with Parkinson's. And I know it's likely rich coming from a person who works at a research funding agency but I'm gonna say it, more research is needed. But I'll also quote the late Doug Altman who said, we need better research and we need research done for the right reasons. My dad was willing to support science, 
to help improve our understanding of this debilitating disease with the hope of finding new treatments that could help others. But the system wasn't set up to enable this to happen. We must do better and we can do better if we put patients first. Next slide, which is my last slide, please. So with that being said, let me conclude with a question for you. Knowing what you know now about CIHR and our plans to support the integration of evidence in health decisions, what can we do to help you in your work? And with that, I say thank you, and I'll turn it back to you, Sterling. Thank you very much, Tammy. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I, I thank you particularly for sharing the story of your of your dad. Um, it's uh, probably not an easy story for you to share. I understand that and really appreciate uh, your willingness to, to share that story and to reflect on the insights that come from his experience uh, or your, your, your parents' experience. Thank you very much indeed. And, and also thank you for, for sharing so much about CIHR and the changes that are afoot um, and the exciting developments that are, that are coming forward. I really appreciate that. Good. Let's move now to our uh, panel uh, discussion. So what I'm going to encourage, uh, so the, the way that we're going to structure this is we will bring our panel onto the main stage. We have already done that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and um, we will um, provide each panelist with an opportunity to uh, give some initial thoughts. Um, we've, uh, we've asked them not to use slides so that we keep this conversational. Um, uh, everyone was in agreement, some uh, more so than others. Um, but anyway, they all agreed to not use slides. Um, so we, we have an opportunity for each panelist to give some reflections. Uh, and, and in terms of opportunities, that they see from their perspective of the uh, framework of learning health systems that we're now discussing, uh, as well as challenges that, uh, that, that exist that we need to reflect upon. And then we will ha have an opportunity to uh, address questions that uh, the audience uh, have. So I will encourage you to uh, submit questions and you can do that through using the Q&A uh, tab that exists on the, I think it's the bottom left-hand corner of the uh, of the uh, uh, conference uh, screen that you'll be seeing. Uh, so if you just click on that, uh, you can include your name, but you don't have to. It can be an anonymous question, and those will come through, and we can uh, have have discussion uh, from uh, from audience questions as well. So um, again, thank you very much, Tammy. Um, so the order, the 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 batting order, if you like, uh, if we want to use a cricketing analogy, uh, will be Kim. McGrail will go first, then Adira Levin, and then Jacqueline Robinson, and then Margot Greenwood. Um, and so uh, we'll um, go to you, Kim, if we can, first of all, for your reflections on opportunities and challenges, particularly uh, from, a, from a data perspective. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of this family and um, really uh, something to follow um, uh, Tammy and that uh, really great presentation. So I'm, I'm here because um, I'm, well, I, I'm going to take the perspective and giving these comments that I'm, I'm scientific director of Health Data Research Network Canada, as Sterling indicated. Um, and we are, uh, um, this network is a, a pan-provincial, uh, pan-Canadian network of uh, individuals and organizations that are dedicated to supporting multi-regional research. And what I mean by that is that we have this opportunity to do research in Canada that might include multiple provinces or the entire country or um, provinces and territories and so on. And, but that's really challenging to do in the in the data intensive space, which is the one that I work in. Um, and so we were very fortunate to receive funding from CIHR under the SPORE program, uh, so the Strategy for Patient Oriented Research, to develop um, what's called the SPORE Canadian Data Platform. Um, so this is not a centralized uh, hub of data. It is. It is an. Um, this is why we have, have approached this um, as a network, 
And really what it is, is it's a, it's a number of initiatives that we are undertaking to try to make it more possible, um, efficient, uh, attractive, and supportive in the way that we encourage and help researchers do these kinds of multi-regional um, projects. And, and we may be interested in doing this because um, we have small populations and really want to study things that are a rare condition or a rare outcome. Um, we may want to do this because there's so much opportunity to learn from the different ways that healthcare services are funded, delivered, and organized in our different jurisdictions. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a shame to have those differences and not to, to um, take what we can from those. So in thinking about this, we're really thinking in the framing of learning health systems and trying to develop uh, our approaches and the underlying data systems as, um, as ways to, to enable that. So the data that I'm talking about really are sort of all of the foundational population-based population information that we have because we have um, the kind of publicly funded or largely publicly funded healthcare systems that we do. So this would be things like um, information on physician encounters and prescription drugs and um, home and community care services, uh, hospitalizations and, and other things like that. And for the most part, and a lot of those data are available for the entire populations of provinces and territories. So if we add that up, it's to the 36 million or so people who live in Canada. So if we think about um, learning health care or learning health systems, they're really what I would call socio-technical systems. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, that they include hardware and software, but also people and organizations and communities. So despite the fact that if I'm here talking to you about data, we might be thinking that that's more in the technical side of things, we actually come at this from really concentrating as much on the socio or the social side of things as well. So on the technical side, and I'll just spend a couple minutes telling you the kinds of things that we're trying to do within our network. On the, on the technical side of things, we're doing the things you might expect, um, creating data catalogs so that researchers know what kind of data they can request through HDR in Canada and our partner um, sites making data more visible and um, trying to support uh, more efficient access to those data. As Tammy said, a, a fundamental feature of learning health systems is timely data. So we're working on that. Better tools and support so that people can actually have data that are comparable across the different healthcare systems in Canada because data are collected in different ways. They don't necessarily mean the same thing in each of those places. So that's the kind of more technical side of things, the kind of bread and butter of how do you get data? How do you make the data um, formulated in a way that you can actually answer questions in a reasonable way? But we have a really strong, and I'd say equal commitment to the social side of this kind of endeavor as well. So for example, we're really um, in, have a commitment to public involvement in the way that we're doing things. We have a public advisory council. We're working on things like increasing transparency so that that everybody can understand more about the kinds of data that our data centers and other organizations like ours hold, um, where they come from, how we use them safely, who gets to use them, what projects are being supported. It's just that, that the, just the simple transparency part, part of things. We're also working uh, on plain language about data so that we can talk about some of these concepts in ways that are uh, accessible to a broader audience. And we're working on, um, and I, I don't love this terminology, but social license for use of data, meaning that are we sure that what we're doing is consistent with public values and expectations? Are we responding, as Tammy was indicating, to patient priorities, public priorities, and so on? So all of that is a is work um, in the, that that public public arena. Equally, we have a very um, strong commitment and work underway to support indigenous data sovereignty, recognizing that these are rights-based and nation-to-nation -nation relationships that we really need to treat indigenous-related data differently. And we're working on the, the precise ways that we're going to be able to do that within our network and, and our partner data centers. But the idea here is that this is changing we're finally um, recognizing uh, our commitments under uh, um, Truth and Reconciliation, under um, our um, signing on to the 
um, Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and um, that 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 we need to do things differently, and that within HDR in Canada we can actually hold ourselves to a higher standard and help move that conversation along. So we're we're working very much in that area. And then the third piece on this side is we have a really strong commitment to principles of idea, and that's in inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And so things that would fall under there are, um, are we um, conscious of how we're um, either analyzing or understanding equity within the, the data that people use? Can we use the, the sorts of data I'm talking about to actually help advance understanding of um, gender-based analysis of um, uh, marginalized populations, groups that have not um, fared so well within our health system so far, can we make sure that we have those kinds of um, equity addressing research? So this is not about doing more descriptive epidemiology about them, the, the uh, inequities that exist, but how do we use data systems and our research profiles to actually begin to close those gaps and, and address and do something about the inequities? Um, so there's lots more I can say, but I will um, stop there and uh, really look forward to the rest of the discussion. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Kim. Um, we are getting some questions from the, uh, from the audience, so uh, please feel free to continue to submit your questions and we'll, uh, we'll have some opportunity to, to discuss those later on. I'm going to turn straight over to Adira. Um, and we did say uh, five to seven minutes, so um, thank you for, I'm sure that you'll uh, abide by that, Adira, please. Yeah, great, thanks, Sterling, and, and thanks, Tammy, and everyone else for being here. So I come at this learning health system from a, a, group, a different, three different perspectives. So one is um, BC Renal is a model within, um, within the context of the healthcare system in British Columbia, which started out with the premise that kidney disease was an expensive uh, way to expensive treatment for people and that in order for us to learn and understand and have evidence informed care, we needed to have all the data and the ability to uh, invent and uh, evolve in the context of um, that data knowledge. And so it was a long time ago and it was before learning health system was even a phrase, but it was actually created in that spirit of um, we don't know what we don't know until you look at the information. The information needs to be collected in a rigorous way uh, for patient care delivery uh, with patients and their families, and that we should uh, learn and evolve and re-involve. And I noticed there's a question in the chat about quality improvement and, and in very much that spirit. And then I've had the privilege of trying to create within a world of pandemic with our patient partners, Jackie being one of them, a PCICCN, the Post-COVID Integrated Clinical Care Network. And the goal of that was to say, from the very beginning, we don't know what we don't know. So why don't we systematically collect information on all people who have persistent symptoms that are referred to these clinics, so it's not all people, but uh, and try and learn and then put into place what is the most effective treatment, what is the most, uh, most effective and cost-effective way to assess and manage these people, and try and do it from that perspective. Um, and it wasn't with the research grant that we did that. It was with uh, a little bit of our research funding from the ministry and um, Michael Smith Health Research Foundation and some other foundations, but mostly um, trying to truly integrate research into care in real time, thinking that the pandemic was that moment where people would get it. And whilst we did not badly. We didn't do it as well as we could have because of all the things that Kim just finished talking about. There are issues with data. There are issues with sharing. There are issues with uh, patients wanting very much to participate and ethics and contracts and various other things holding things up in terms of what they can finally um, get to. And you know, so I, I think that many of us, or I think it's certainly on this call, but many of us very much would like to codify this learning health system so that it's truly research is care and care is research. And that's the way that we need to do business in this country. Um, we're too big and too small <laughs> to keep reinventing the wheel province by province and institution by institution. And so if each province or microcosm could become its learning health system and we shared across, 
wouldn't that be a novel way to think about how we do things? Um, more recent, uh, prior to PCICCN and in between, we've been also privileged to have a pan-Canadian network called CanSolve CKD, Canadian Seeking Innovations uh, to Solve Kidney Diseases. And that's been an experience as well because having patients and policymakers uh, and everyone and the researchers and the clinicians at the table, including our very large indig Indigenous uh, Peoples Engagement and Research Council, informing not just the projects, but how they're executed, and then how they're going to be used and what they're interpreted, what they're in, how they're interpreted and how they should inform policies, both for care as well as for research has been really novel. Um, importantly, many of our patients are quite frustrated with all the systems that they see that we put in place, quote unquote, to protect them. When in fact, it feels like they can't be in the studies that they would like to be in and they can't participate in the things they wanna participate in. Um, and so I, I think that if we learn one of the other aspects from a sort of macro perspective is perhaps the learning health system in this context of CIHR and all of the funding institutions and the healthcare systems in Canada should be that we should learn what doesn't work and put into place what does work because that we should be ourselves a microcosm of a learning health system because we've spent many, many um, hours and, and days and manuscripts uh, trying to articulate what some of the challenges and problems are, but we, we spent that equal energy just trying to fix it and teach each other and learn from each other how best to fix it. In a rigorous way, I think we get a lot further. Um, and I guess, um, you know, to be, to, when we created the PCICCN, which uh, Jackie will talk about in a moment, again, the, the post-COVID interdisciplinary clinical care network, we created with, by, and primarily for the patients. We never, this, it was never, and Sterling's nodding, like you remember all those conversations, right? The only reason we're doing this is because we think that we need to learn in real time about this thing called long COVID so that we can offer the best care in real time. And that was the momentum, if you will, that actually helped everyone to get up every morning and keep going, despite the fact that it was piecemeal funded and, and piecemeal put together, et cetera. Because, so I think that the concept of keeping your eye on the most important thing, which is what are we doing and how are we doing it? For whom are we doing this? as actually the center of a learning health system and, and being humble enough to say, we did it wrong. We're gonna, we're gonna recalibrate, we're gonna fix it, we're gonna change it, or we did it right and how do we learn from it? I think is, are some of the things that, uh, that I've been you know, really impressed with in terms of the collective. And then working across all the different, um, not just pillars that you commented on, Tammy, but also all the, the diverse perspectives, you know, from data collection to um, data, um, um, uh, like creating and developing uh, provincial or interprovincial information systems to figuring out how to share things, from standing up a biobank to making sure that we engage rural, remote, and indigenous peoples in all of the things that we do. That's, that's a lot of work for everyone, but it's really enriching and we all learn from each other. And uh, I guess one last thing that I was another really interesting opportunity that I personally had was um, I was on a supervisory committee for um, a, a master's student in the School of Public Health. And all of the, and it was, um, she was working with indigenous communities in terms of a kidney check program, which is um, how to ensure that kidneys are healthy in indigenous communities. And all the timelines of the school didn't match with the timelines with, of the people that she was working with. And in a pandemic, they really got thrown off. And so her thesis became about how one best adapts your program to meet the needs of what you're trying to actually ask and answer and learn from that so that, you know, those deadlines of March 31st of X don't always apply um, and you can't always control it. And it was a really interesting, interesting defense to listen to um, because it, it was yet another level of what you can learn. If the institutions can learn as well as the scientists and the people, I think we get to a very different place. So maybe I'll just stop there because I'm sure I've taken more than my five. 
you had seven, so that was fine. Thank you very much, Adira. Perfect. Um, let's move on to uh, to Jacqueline and uh, an opportunity to have a, a lived experience perspective on this. Thank you, Jacqueline. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Is it Miss? my honor to be on this esteemed panel and share from my patient perspective what it feels like to be involved uh, with the post-COVID interdisciplinary clinical care network in BC, which is modeled as a learning health system. Um, I contracted COVID-19 in March 2020 and as a nurse for over 20 years and a reasonably young and healthy person, I reassured my husband and three daughters I would be fine. Um, but unfortunately, on day eight of my illness, I took a turn for the worse and ended up admitted to Vancouver General Hospital ICU and was put on a ventilator just hours after I arrived. I was in ICU for nearly two weeks and once I was discharged home, I spent months with the effects this virus had taken on my body and my mind. In the weeks following my admission, during many follow-up calls from my doctors, we were both realizing that there was so much we needed to know how to care for patients um, after their COVID infection. So this was a time, I'm sure as you can remember, where we were all, we didn't know at very much at all. We were all learning, you know, not just clinicians, but patients and families as well. And I was asked to join the post-COVID interdisciplinary clinical care network in June 2020 and have been a patient partner with that network since its inception. And from a patient perspective, I found myself in a room on Zoom, of course, with academics, researchers, clinicians, specialists, and other patients. And we were all listening, learning, collaborating as we worked together to design a care model where we could learn with and from patients and provide education to multiple stakeholders in BC and embed research into clinical care. I would leave these Zoom calls still so weak from my infection, you know, multiple times a week on these calls, completely energized. Um, it was an essential part of my own recovery as it gave a very traumatic experience in my life meaning. It was a community, an ecosystem where I witnessed deep and active engagement. We trusted each other, respected each other, and we were working to steer this work forward. And the learning health systems, you know, represent environments in which the culture both supports and facilitates continuous improvement in patient care through fostering community. And I experienced that firsthand. The post-COVID network aims to support, you know, the best possible outcomes for people recovering from these lingering uh, symptoms after a COVID-19 infection through research, education, and care. And I, with great privilege, get to live and breathe this work every day, now as the clinical nurse specialist with the network. And I consider it a great honor to serve patients, families, healthcare providers, and research facilitating this knowledge sharing as we move this work forward. We now have five post-COVID recovery clinics in BC where research is embedded into clinical care, including standardized data collection and these patients' results and diagnostics and outcomes are captured now in a provincial database. This is exciting. This is advancing knowledge in real time. We are learning with and from these patients and families, and we continue to pivot as new evidence and knowledge is learned. And as I'm sure you recognize, we still have a lot to learn about the long-term impacts of COVID-19, but ultimately we cannot learn about them, you know, ask the right research questions or improve patient outcomes unless patients are involved in the process. And this is the essence of a learning health system. And I'm grateful every day to be a part of it. And as an opportunity, I challenge us as, you know, all of us um, participants in this conference to reflect on is how can we put patients first and foster this type of community 
where we listen, learn, and collaborate together to empower research that will change lives and integrate this evidence, as Tammy spoke to, into health decisions. I'm hoping my lived experience with this will help enlighten some of these conversations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. And uh, yeah, thank you for everything you've been do doing for the ICCN um, and, and that transition from patient partner now to actually being part of the delivery of the, the network. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fabulous to, to see and thank you for that. Um, I'd like to move then to, to Margot and give you an opportunity to give some reflections on opportunities and challenges. Thank you, Margot. Thank you, Sterling. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the ancestors and unceded lands of the lately Tene people. I am grateful every day for their generosity to allow me to live, work, and play in their territory. I also want to um, thank this panel and, and the organizers for the invitation to speak. I, get, I think I have to own right up front that I'm uh, new to learning health systems or those words. I think I may have lived it in other ways, but, uh, but I'm a newbie in this. So forgive me if I say um, things that everybody else already knows. Um, my comments are coming from three places. First, as the, national, or the academic lead of the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health. That is a uh, center that we've had for 17 years, and its focus has been on knowledge translation and all the various words that go around um, that concept. Um, so I've been uh, living that part of this. I also have been the vice president of Indigenous Health for the last eight years in the Northern Health Authority. Um, and so a lot of what examples that I'm going to share with you in this next five minutes comes from that place. And of course, I am a Nihio. I am Cree, um, and I am a Cree woman. Um, and so, of course, I always bring that lived experience uh, with me to whatever I talk about. So I, I sort of, um, as I was thinking about this and having the conversations the, with the panelists, I sort of have two uh, sections or sets of comments, if you will. I have some overarching comments that kind of occurred to me as I was learning from people and thinking about this. And then I'd like to share some very practical um, experiences that I've had in the health authority that I think realize aspects of a learning health system. Um, so that's what I've, uh, I've done. I was thinking, at, first of all, about some of the core values uh, that underline these models. I did a bit of background reading so I could get a better understanding for myself. I think on the operational side, um, commitments like anti-racism, anti-coloniality, self-determination. I see self-determination in many places when we're actually operationalizing, are we, are our strategies, our practices, our policies, our structures, are they challenging? Are they being anti-racist? Are we challenging coloniality? And I think that stems from a realization and understanding that we live in a colonial country. And it isn't just about health. It's about many sectors, and I think uh, that's an underlying value. So I think about that as we think about applying the, this to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples in this country. I also find myself a lot of times, and sometimes people get upset with me, oh, oh, Margot's going to go off in her long story now. <laughs> but it's really contextualizing the realities for Indigenous people because those lived experiences, that history is not the same. And I think it's accepting that. And so I spend lots of time just contextualizing that reality. And I think that's an important piece. And sometimes we miss that. We assume people know things, but they don't. And I think you spoke about it, uh, especially when we're focusing on those we serve. And as I listen to patient first, I think about who is it that I am serving? 
And what is it that I need to know about them? So it leads me to a question that we've grappled with for many years, and I have no answers. I have lots of questions. I don't have a lot of answers. And I continue to think about them, though. And one of the ones that we've been grappling with at the Collaborating Center for 17 years is when we are talking about evidence, what constitutes evidence? Whose evidence is being privileged? If we accept the fact that there are different systems of knowledge around the world, there are different bodies of evidence. Now, will the question drive what, what evidence you're going to use? Absolutely. Or maybe there's more um, sets of evidence, if you will. So you, we're then looking at the interface of knowledge systems and the evidence that are born and anchored in those systems of knowledge and how do we bring that to bear on the contemporary challenge that we're facing. So I always kind of think about these kinds of things also in very practical terms. If I'm sitting with a young mother, First Nations mother in a, in a community, what is it that I really need to know about her? What is it um, that I should understand so that I may serve her and her family best? One of the things that we've done in Northern Health is we have what's called Aboriginal or slash Indigenous Health Improvement Committees. And they are groups that are located across uh, the north and the upper two thirds of British Columbia, where um, First Nations, Métis, Aboriginal serving organizations, and the local leadership from the health authority can come together. And they can surface the challenges. Um, and one of the things, questions that we have challenged these groups with early on was if I was a new practitioner coming to your community, what would you like me to know about you so I can serve you better? So in this system, we were able to develop over 55 community-based cultural resources in response to that question. And the work continues. And I think that's a really innovative and exciting place to be because really, if all of this work is about point of care and about that relationship that happens in that moment. And that's really important to me, um, especially in uh, British Columbia and in the current context that we're in. I wanna talk about uh, um, a sort of model of system change, if you, feel, if you will. I don't know if it's a model, but it's uh, something that I use a lot. Um, and it has three components and, and, and you're all gonna be familiar with this. It's an ecological model. And of course I'm on that social side. I like to think about that as the human side, bringing the humanness of, of who we are into all of these uh, pieces of work and thinking that we do. The model really looks at what happens at the very practice level, what happens at the systems level, what happens at the structural level. And let me say, when I think about this, that I truly believe that structures and systems are to enable good practice. So if we really want change, it isn't going to be just what happens at the practice level. It needs to be enabled and supported by the system itself and the structures that impact that system. We can apply this to the health system, to the education system, the justice system, so on and so on. But I'm going to talk about three examples, uh, an example in each of those levels that we've been able to do within Northern Health that I think exemplifies this. The first was really looking at that practice level because it's right at that level when people are interacting with each other practitioners, those that we serve. What happens in that interaction? Do we know who it is that we're serving? Are we aware of the nuances of communication, the histories, the understanding that we need? So in order to support 
practitioners to be the very best they can be because people are doing incredible work, just incredible. Here's something that may help it to be even better. And that is we developed a respectful relationships, cultural safe, culturally safe indigenous health care. And it's, it's, a, um, it's an education strategy. It is, uh, it's a 20 hour course that really begins to look at some of the things that I've talked about that begins to give you some of that background. And then uh, the first two, there's four modules. The first two focus on knowledge information for people, because if you're new to an area, you may not know anything uh, about the people, uh, indigenous people of that area. And then the last two really focus on skills development. They're very scenario-based, practice-based. Um, and so that was a piece that we wanted to do to support our practitioners, to give them that kind of information so they can really be in those relationships um, in a very powerful and positive way. And that's not to diminish anything they already do. At the systems Thanks. level, we created an assessment tool so, sorry, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, uh, we just, I, I want to give, give some time for some general uh, discussion. So, I, can I oh, just okay. ask you to just okay. draw, draw to a close pretty quickly? Thanks. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> I should have timed myself better. My sure, apologies. No at the systems level, we have an assessment tool that really looks at inclusion, engagement, access, and evaluation. And then the final, we really look at the big structures. And I think of those as big legislation, accreditation those sorts of things. So um, I will just end it there. Um, I'm hoping that uh, that gives you some sense of what we've done. Thanks. That, that, that's, Thanks thank, you so, thank you so much, Margaret. That was, that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, really, I really appreciate the, like, you know, being new to the learning health systems and then actually like giving us examples of, of work that we should, you know, we should be sort of understanding in this context perhaps and, and actually like sort of learning from ourselves uh, the way that uh, you describe the Indigenous Health Improvement Committees that have been created in the North uh, sounds very much as you know, like we've got we've got uh, an opportunity to 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 engage in uh, and and learn from from how that practice is uh, is 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 working and moving forward. So thank you, thank you very much. I, I want to try and uh, at least give uh, some airtime for some of the questions that have come in uh, from the audience. So thank you very much. There's. Uh, there's a theme in the in, in in a couple of questions to do with quality improvement, uh, quality improvement projects, and the funding of of quality improvement uh, in the context of of learning health systems. And this is something I think is is important for us to to sort of reflect on. Perhaps is 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 learning health systems all about research, or is actually learning health systems partly about research, but partly about learning in other in other uh, ways. Um, and it may be that we actually sort of see learning that can happen that's actually not going to be classified as research as such. Or maybe it doesn't matter whether it's classified as research in that way. Are we actually moving into a world where we have more, um, more, more uh, uh, sort of messiness in terms of the, the learning uh, sort of space? I don't know if someone wants to pick up on that, uh, that topic. Kim has a big smile on her face, so I'm going to go to Kim. Thank, Thank you. you. No, I will. So I, I find so I'll, I'll be really um, quick with this, but I I really think that um, part of our our struggle here is that we use the same words to mean different things and different words to mean the same things, and I don't really love all of these distinctions among quality improvement, research, evaluation, and so on. I th think that, you know, they're all learning activities. And I think what the, my brand for research is that it's, it's a rigorous approach that will produce generalizable knowledge. And you could, but you can do that in the quality improvement space. You can do it in evaluation space. You can do it with research. So it's much more about the methods. And, and I think picking up on what Margot said, the methods really, and the um, epistemological approach or the worldview approach we bring to this, that they match the question. Great, thank you very much. Would others support that? Yeah, I think we're codifying, like we're using the word LA Learning Health System as maybe an umbrella term and maybe in part of the 
learning and relearning, we need to sort of mean what we say, like say it differently so that people can access it. Because, you know, again, if we're saying patient focused, I'm not sure that patients understand learning health system or what it would mean if we're meaning it differently to different people. But yeah. we would like to learn with you, from you, and for you. How's that? <laughs> right? Like, isn't that what this is actually about? Um, yes. And what can we do to help you learn with us for you and you know like i think that we just need to make it much more accessible to people and i think it links back to this sort of i think there's a theme that in 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 pretty much all of the presentations that we've heard around i mean kim started off with socio-technical um you know margo you you were using um uh, i think uh like you know asking the question who are we serving um, you know, which is critically important, and, and that sort of you know, creating the learning community, I think, is is sort of like you know the, the very first piece. And you know, I think Adira was like sort of questioning like what works, and and even like who judges what works. Uh, you know, like that sort of community based approach, and the sort of I think is is uh, is is a theme that you know how do we ensure that we have have that? I, I want to get to another question. Um, this is actually from Diane Feingood. So Diane would never forgive me if I didn't ask her a question. So I'm going to make sure I do. Um, so Diane, I, I think this probably goes maybe for you, Tammy, first, if we could. So current research funding models seem inadequate for building the collective collaborative impact we need for well-functioning learning health systems. So to what extent is CHR contemplating additional new models uh, in order to support uh, this approach? A uh, terrific question, and I agree, Sterling, that if you didn't ask uh, this question from Diane, you would be hearing about it afterwards. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it, it is a great question, and, and to answer very honestly, I mean, to what extent are we contemplating new models? I would say that's exactly the stage uh, that we're at right now. Um, I moved into this role a little over two weeks ago, maybe it's three weeks ago now, um, and really you know, as I've shown you, getting the team in place in order to be able to kind of get things moving. But what I do anticipate in the coming months is, is engaging with you uh, and others across the country in terms of what, what has CIHR done in the past that we're no longer doing that you think might be helpful? What are we currently doing that we should keep on doing and if possible, maybe enhance? And then what things do you think we need to add to this, you know, toolkit, if you will, in terms of providing support? And, and maybe I'll just pick up on a, you know, a, there's a question I know that's been shared from, from Esther in the audience about, you know, what other things uh, might, might we contemplate uh, in order to support a, a rapid, right, answering questions rapidly, then turning to the next one. And, you know, what I have heard in some very early uh, chats with folks is whether we should be contemplating uh, programs of funding as opposed to project by project by project funding. Um, so, you know, you can imagine what that might look like. You might take a particular area, uh, clinical condition, uh, and, and kind of map out some questions to start, get those answered. By answering those questions, you may very find, well find some other questions but instead of you needing to come to CIHR, you know, every six months with, you know, here's my application for, you know, these five questions, could we think about a program of funding? And that way you can, you know, answer all the questions that you can possibly do within that, that bundle of funding. So again, I will be coming back. I hope to be coming back to, uh, to you in order to, uh, to chat about this further, but I certainly welcome your thoughts uh, in advance. We very much are contemplating this. Of course, the other factor that goes along here is where's the money going to come from? So, but I'm going to say first things first, we'll get the great ideas, we'll make the business case, and then we'll see where we'll go. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, obviously, provincial funding uh, uh, bodies uh, should be part of that conversation and I think have, uh, have some you know, to sort of uh, responsibility for thinking, thinking these, these things through as well. Um, let me go to another question, if I can. Um, this is from Anonymous. Um, so how can we tackle the data privacy barrier 
Um, I think this probably goes to Kim. So um, the suggestion is that other provinces and countries don't seem to have the same barriers. Um, so what can we do in BC? So I, I would, um, it, it, this is an issue for sure. Um, I would always caution about looking to um, what we believe that other um, countries are doing because if you scratch the surface often it turns out that they, they face the same kinds of challenges that we are, but some of them are for sure are a bit further down the road. I would say that, you know, a lot of the success in the UK that I have seen has come from a decade of work and pretty heavy investment in public consultation, conversations, building platforms, investing in things that can be used for more than um, one particular research question, for example, but, but that engagement really coming first and foremost. So I think some of this is that it, it is going to take some time. We have done some of that work. Um, and, I, and I think that there is a, a path now um, through a number of initiatives um, that will help to change this. But you know, the, the, the fact is that our structures are not conducive to moving things quickly right now. There's multiple review points, um, multiple different players involved. And I think part of what we need first and foremost is a common vision and a common ob objective and a real commitment to say, you know, actually BC wants to do something different and wants to make some progress in this area. And if we have that commitment and then we um, invest in the engagement and the kind of um, building things up from um, the bottom up as well, I think we can get somewhere. Great, thank you very much, Kim. So last question, um, and we'll have to be very quick in responding to it. Uh, this one I want to uh, uh, point towards Margot, if I can. Um, so the question comes, uh, speaking to the types of evidence and knowledge that we privilege, what are your thoughts on using a two-eyed seeing approach to learning health systems? Would you just give us a quick response to that, Margot? I think any approach, whether it be I typically uh, think about Willie Ermine's work around ethical space, um, and that's the interface of diverse knowledge systems. So any, any strategy, any model that begins to bring that in, I think is important. I'm not uh, saying it should be this or that or any of those, because I think they all have value. Um, and so, yes, I would agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tammy, for giving us the keynote presentation and for uh, Margot and Adira and Jacqueline and Kim uh, for uh, your engagement uh, as panelists. I, I think uh, this is the start of the conversation. Uh, we're uh, we're um, embarking on phase two where learning health systems uh, for the support unit is a key component. And we, uh, we're excited at the opportunity to take this agenda forward uh, in British Columbia. Um, I am, uh, I, I, I find it impossible to take off my economist hat. So the thing that's ringing in my mind is research waste and like that sort of like staggering uh, sort of uh, uh, indication of the level of research waste, I think is something that we should not, cannot ignore. Um, and, and I think the, the root of learning health systems seems to be perfectly positioned to really help us address that problem. So thank you for giving us that, uh, that clear steer and clear statement, uh, Tammy, in your, uh, in your presentation. So um, uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, at this point, uh, if we were in person, there would be a standing ovation, I am absolutely certain. So uh, please, uh, you can just in your minds see that standing ovation of the audience uh, and I think there are over 300 people uh, in the audience so that would be quite a, a noise that you would be would be hearing so thank you very much everyone um, we now move to a short uh, break so you have five minutes until the start of breakout session four and I look forward to seeing you in one of those sessions shortly thank you again <laughs>